The purpose of this video is to provide you with the historical references and details proving that the Edomites formed the nucleus of what would become known as the Sephardic Jewish community, who were originally black but progressively altered their phenotype over time by intermarrying with the general European population, the royalty, and also later intermixing with the Khazarian Jews while living in Poland and other countries along the Slavic belt, also known as the Pale of Jewish Settlement. The nation of Edom rose to power over the Yahudim during the Roman occupation of Yehuda, gaining control of the temple, selection of high priests, and sacred treasury. They had previously been conquered by the Yahudim, but permitted to stay in the land if they would choose to abide by their laws and customs. As the Roman Empire expanded, so did the nation of Edom. Seeking positions of authority and high status, they intermarried with the Romans and other foreigners of high rank. Over time, they would spread into all the lands bordering the Mediterranean Sea. Two of Herod the Great's sons would be banished into Europe. Herod Archelaus was banished to Vienna, a city of Gaul, which is located in modern-day France. And Herod Antipas was banished to Spain. I believe this was the beginning of the Sephardic communities in Europe. Along with the arrival of the Sidonians, who were known to profess themselves to be Yahudim from time to time, and had arrived in two waves. The first being the Carthaginian invasion of Spain, and the second being the Moorish capture of Spain. These Edomites and Sidonians formed the nucleus of the emerging Sephardic community in Spain and France. Heavily intermixing with the European population, including the royalty, and over time altering their original phenotype so that many of them could pass for white. Edom was originally black, just like Yaakov. Through intermixing, a large number of his descendants are passing for white or have accepted honorary white status, while some are still black or passing as members of other nations of people. Though many Edomites can pass for white or have accepted honorary white status, not all white people are Edomites. Therefore, it's incorrect to say that all white people are Edomites. We also have people in our own community that can pass for white. It may seem strange, but there exists a historical precedence of nations claiming the identity of other nations. We'll cover four cases here. The Greco-Roman invasion of Egypt, the Sidonians, and finally, that of Edom and the Khazars. Josephus against Appion, Book 1, Paragraph 2. And now in the first place, I cannot but greatly wonder at those men who suppose that we must attend to none but the Grecians when we are inquiring about the most ancient facts, and must inform ourselves of their truth from them only, while we must not believe ourselves nor other men, for I am convinced that the very reverse is the truth of the case. I mean this. If we will not be led by vain opinions, but will make inquiry after truth from facts themselves, for they will find that almost all which concerns the Greeks happened not long ago. In fact, one may say is of yesterday only. I speak of the building of their cities, the inventions of their arts, and the description of their laws. And as for their care about the writing down of their histories, it is very near the last thing they said about. However, they acknowledge themselves so far that they were the Egyptians, the Chaldeans, and the Phoenicians. For I will not now reckon ourselves among them that have preserved the memorials of the most ancient and most lasting traditions of mankind. For almost all these nations inhabit such countries as are least subject to destruction from the world about them. And these also have taken special care to have nothing omitted of what was remarkably done among them. But their history was esteemed sacred and put into public tables as written by men of the greatest wisdom they had among them. 
but as for the place where the Greshens inhabit, 10,000 destructions have overtaken it and blotted out the memory of former actions so that they were ever beginning a new way of living and suppose that every one of them was the origin of their new state. It was also late and with difficulty that they came to know the letters they now use. For those who would advance their use of these letters to the greatest antiquity, pretend that they learned them from the Phoenicians and from Cadmus, yet is nobody able to demonstrate that they have any writing preserved from that time, neither in their temples nor in any other public monuments. This appears because the time when those lived who went to the Trojan War so many years afterward is in great doubt and great inquiry is made whether the Greeks used their letters at that time, and the most prevailing opinion in that nearest the truth is that their present way of using those letters was unknown at that time. But then, for those that first introduced philosophy and the consideration of things celestial and divine among them, such as Phrasades the Syrian and Pythagoras and Thales, all with one consent agree that they learned what they knew of the Egyptians and the Chaldeans and wrote but little. And these are the things which are supposed to be the oldest of all among the Greeks, and they have much ado to believe that the writings ascribed to those men are genuine. Herodias, the Histories they said, moreover, that the Egyptians were the first who brought into use appellation for the twelve gods, and the Hellens took up the use from them, and that they were the first who assigned altars and images and temples to the gods, and who engraved figures on stone. And with regard to the greater number of these things, they showed me evidence that they had happened so. These observances, then, and others besides these, which I shall mention, the Hellens have adopted from the Egyptians. George G.M. James, Stolen Legacy From the conquest of Egypt by Alexander the Great, the Greeks, who were always attracted by the mysterious worship of the Nile land, began to imitate the Egyptian religion in its entirety. And during the Roman occupation, the Egyptian religion spread not only to Italy, but throughout the Roman Empire, including Brittany. Key points to remember. Egyptian knowledge was the foundation of Greek learning. Egyptian knowledge and religion was spread throughout the Roman Empire. Greeks and Romans not only imitated Egyptian culture, they started to pretend that they were the Egyptians. The Greeks not only claimed that they were the Egyptians, but also the Chaldeans and Venetians. This mental illness still persists today among many Europeans. In Hollywood films, you constantly see European actors cast not just in non-white character roles, but specifically in historically black character roles, most often pretending to be Egyptians and Hebrews. They also like to be the last of everything, the last of the Mohicans the last samurai, the last man on earth. We know that them pretending to be Egyptians and Hebrews in Africa is simply ridiculous. Their own physiology betrays that possibility. Their skin type cannot handle the intensity of the sun at that latitude unprotected. That is part of the reason why a large number of Greeks and Romans living in Egypt intermarried with the local population. The Book of Yohanan, John, chapter 4, verses 5 through 15. So he came to a city of Shomeron, called Shechem, near the piece of land Yaakob gave to his son Yosef. And Yaakob's fountain was there. So Yehusha, being wearied from the journey, was sitting thus at the fountain. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Shomeron came to draw water. Yehusha said to her, Give me drink. 
where his top ones had gone off into the city to buy food. The woman of Shomeron therefore said to him, How is it that you, being a Yehudi, ask a drink from me, a woman of Shomeron? For the Yahudim do not associate with the Shomeronim. Yehusha answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of Elohim, and who it is who says to you, Give me drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Master, you have no vessel, and the well is deep. From where then do you have living water? Are you greater than our father Yaakov, who gave us the well and drank from it himself and his sons and his cattle? Yehusha answered and said to her, Everyone drinking of this water shall thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water I give him shall certainly never thirst. And the water that I give him shall become in him a fountain of water, springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Master, give me of this water so I do not thirst, nor come here to draw. Verses 16 through 26. Yehusha said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Yehusha said to her, You have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Master, I see you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where one needs to worship. Yehusha said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you shall neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, because the deliverance is of the Yahudim. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father also does seek such to worship Him. Elohim is spirit, and those who worship Him need to worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know that Messiah is coming, the one who is called anointed. When that one comes, he shall announce all to us. Yehusha said to her, I who am speaking to you am he. So why did the Yahudim avoid associating with the Shomeronim from Shechem? Jewish Antiquities, Book 11, Chapter 8, Paragraph 6. So when Alexander had thus settled matters at Jerusalem, he led his army into the neighboring cities. And when all the inhabitants to whom he came received him with great kindness, the Samaritans, who had then Shechem for the metropolis, a city situated at Mount Gerizim and inhabited by apostates of the Jewish nation, seeing that Alexander had so greatly honored the Jews, determined to profess themselves Jews, for such is the disposition of the Samaritans. As we have already elsewhere declared, that when the Jews are in adversity, they deny that they are of kin to them, and then they confess the truth. But when they perceive that some good fortune has befallen them, they immediately pretend to have communion with them, saying that they belong to them, and derive their genealogy from the posterity of Joseph Ephraim, and Manasseh. Accordingly, they made their address to the king with splendor and showed great readiness in meeting him at a little distance from Jerusalem. And when Alexander had commended them, the Shechemites approached to him, taking with them the troops that Sambalot had sent him. And they desired that he would come to their city and do honor to their temple also to who he promised that when he returned, he would come to them. And when they petitioned that he would remit the tribute of the seventh year to them, because they did not sow thereon, he asked who they were that made such a petition. 
And when they said that they were Hebrews, but had the name of Sidonians living at Shechem, he asked them again whether they were Jews. And when they said they were not Jews, it was to the Jews, he said, that I granted that privilege. However, when I return and am thoroughly informed by you of this matter, I will do what I shall think proper. Jewish Antiquities, Book 12, Chapter 5, Paragraph 5. When the Samaritans saw the Jews under these sufferings, they no longer confessed that they were of their family, nor that the temple on Mount Gerizim belonged to Almighty God. This was according to their nature, as we have already shown. And they now say that they were a colony of Medes and Persians, and indeed they were a colony of theirs. So they sent ambassadors to Antiochus, and an epistle whose contents are these. To King Antiochus the god Epiphanes, a memorial from the Sidonians who live at Shechem. Our fathers, upon certain frequent plagues, and as following a certain ancient superstition, had a custom of observing that day, which by the Jews is called the Sabbath. And when they had erected a temple at the mountain called Gerizim, though without a name, they offered upon it the proper sacrifices. Now upon the just treatment of these wicked Jews, those that managed their affairs, supposing that we were of kin to them and practiced as they do, make us liable to the same accusations, although we be originally Sidonians, as is evident from the public records. We therefore beg you, our benefactor and savior, to give order to Apollonius, the governor of this part of the country, and to Nicanor, the procurator of your affairs, to give us no disturbance, nor to lay to our charge what the Jews are accused for. Since we are aliens from their nation and from their customs, but let our temple, which at present has no name at all, be named the temple of Jupiter Hellenius. If this were once done, we should be no longer disturbed, but should be more intent on our own occupation with quietness, and so bring in a greater revenue to you. Jewish Antiquities, Book 12, Chapter 4, Paragraph 1. Now at this time the Samaritans were in a flourishing condition, and much distressed the Jews, cutting off parts of their land and carrying off slaves. Key points to remember. The Samaritans are Sidonians. The Sidonians are Canaanites. The Samaritans would lie and claim that they were Yahudim and blood relatives to the Israelites only when they perceived it would benefit them. Though it is strange, a pattern of national identity theft is beginning to emerge. We have the case of the Greeks and the Romans pretending to be the Egyptians, and now the Sidonians claiming to be Yahudim when it seems to benefit them. I will cover Edom and the Khazars in the next video. Shalom.